Okay. Uh, so St. John Chrysostom is one of those that uh, we will be highlighting. And uh, his name in Greek means the silver tongue. So I presume that was because he was such a powerful preacher. Anyway, um, let's, let's begin uh, following the call. And then we're going to get some, uh, I'll lay the groundwork, then we'll get some feedback from um, leading theologians and um, leading persons of the church all the way back to uh, Mormon times. And then uh, let me do. Uh, I know that it don't right now really have to open things up for discussion. People will, uh, uh, will speak up, and that's fine. Um, so let me set the um, let me set the stage a bit. And <clears throat> this now is um, the editor of Following the Call. Jesus call is clear. If anyone would come after me, he, she must deny himself, take up the cross daily, follow me. What does this entail? What does it mean to hear Jesus' voice and follow? I know of no better place to start than to hear what Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount. The very thoughtful theologian and academic um, Harvey Cox uh, calls it the most luminous, most quoted, most analyzed, most contested, most influential discourse in all of human history. So what's in the um, Sermon on the Mount? Well, the Sermon uh, on the Mount is in three main sections. Uh, first, the blessings and character of the citizens of the kingdom of God. So this is to be more specific. These are the Beatitudes. These are those that are blessed and will be entering the kingdom of God. The uh, second part of, uh, of the Sermon on the Mount is in, again, still in Matthew. It is a description of the greater righteousness of the kingdom of God beyond the Mosaic of law, beyond Moses. Uh, and you think of what some of the things that Jesus said, um, he will say, he did say, um, you know, I've heard it said, um, you know, I heard it said that um, you what is, you've heard said that um uh oh yeah that's a good one you've heard it said that you should and if i say you should love them yeah. okay uh you should uh, love your neighbor and hate your enemy but i say to you uh love your neighbor and love all those who persecute you well, that's a pretty hard message. It's not the hardest, they're more common. Um, and finally, Matthew closes with a challenge uh, to the people to put his teachings into practice. The language that Jesus uses is simple in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, there are lots of images. There are there's a lot of human interaction. Uh, among the images, uh, city on a hill, wide gates and narrow gates, beggar on the roadside, thistle and thorn, uh, the, the thorns and thistles get into a pool, and then vine and fig. But the key hope that the Sermon on the Mount brings is good news. Yes, repentance is needed. Jesus doesn't use words about that, but at the end is liberation. 
So what I want to uh, do now, any um, any commentary or questions? This is I'll be pausing like this every now and then. Any uh, questions or? Uh, let me say that we are going to ask for people to be in front uh, at the chair if they have questions or comments uh, this time to make it uh, easier for people to hear if they are on Zoom and or hearing on the recording. So uh, please plan on coming up here if you have something. Yeah, yes, Catherine has said something. Sorry. <laughs> uh, just to say it's interesting um, how different the Sermon on the Mount is or the Beatitudes are in the gospel of Luke, which obviously we won't have time to go into this morning, but as we listen to this, the thing of the Beatitudes in uh, Luke. Thank you. Well, one of the, <clears throat> another of the themes in the uh, Sermon on the Mount is the imperative to share. Uh, and if a man asks you for your, uh, for your coat, English, English. Uh, if a man, Jesus. <laughs> Okay, so one of the themes that comes through the Sermon on the Mount um, is lasting treasures. Uh, and St. Basil the Great, the uh, um, early uh, Bishop of uh, Damascus, Archbishop of Damascus uh, in Roman times, um, he really thought about um, the call uh, that Jesus gave to share um, with those who don't have enough. And this is what St. Paul has to say. The wealth you handle belongs to others. Think of it accordingly. Not for long will it delight you, your wealth. Soon it will slip away from you and be gone. Yet you keep it locked away behind doors and sealed up. And you are sleepless at night, worrying about it. You are like the rich fool in the gospel. You ask, what can I do? How easy it would be for you to say, I will fill the souls of the hungry and invite the poor in for food. But I am longing no know what you say. I am merely holding on to what is mine. Okay, explain why you are rich when others are poor. Surely it is so that you can win the reward of being generous, being faithful stewards. And yet, who keeps stuffing everything in your own pockets? Who is the covetous man? It is the man for whom enough is not enough. Indeed, you are covetous when you keep for your own use what you were given for sharing. All the way that we have been given is for sharing. When a man strips another of his clothes, he is called a thief. Did not the man who has the power to clothe the naked does not do that? Shouldn't he be called the same thief? You do injustice to every man whom you can help, but do not. Now, there's another, um, uh, any, any commentary or anything that surprised you? He said, he said what you just read. Who said it? Oh, this is St. Basil the, uh, the Great. He was a uh, father of the church, a um, uh, uh, in Damascus in well, it was Roman times, probably the early years, 300s. And presumably, still, he inspired the St. Basil's Cathedral in Moscow? Yes. That oh, yeah. Same St. Basil. Uh, and uh, well, 
Okay. Uh, <laughs> we'll move on. Right. Uh, I'd like to um, give another perspective now on lasting treasure. And of course, as Jesus said, um, your lasting treasures are the treasures that you give with your heart. Um, so I'd like to see if someone would. Um, I have another commentary. I've seen this one by John West. So we jumped from the early, very early church up to John West. Um, it's uh, four paragraphs. Uh, it's a great. Would you want to read that one? Just come up. Right here. Lasted treasures by John Wesley. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and thieves break in and steal. This is the Matthew test. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Quote, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth, unquote. This is a short command whose meaning is unambiguous. If in spite of this, we do lay up money and goods, if moths may corrupt, thieves break in and steal, why do we call ourselves Christians? We do not obey Jesus Christ. But what must we do with our goods when we have more than we have occasion to use? Jesus gives a very straightforward answer to this question. Lay up treasures in heaven. He that hath pity on the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and what he layeth out, God shall restore to him. Give to the poor, send bread to the hungry, cover the naked with garments, welcome the stranger, carry relief to them that are in prison, and make the widow's heart sing with joy. Thank you. Any, uh, any feedback or comments on what uh, John Wesley had to say about, about this passage? I have a comment. It just struck me this time hearing about uh, compassion for those in prison. And we have felt, and I think throughout most of history, the people who are in prison are people who are bad and mm -hmm. probably morally wrong as well as uh, legally wrong and probably also from an unfortunate class of people who we don't have to pay much attention to. And uh, so we did have a strong period in our country and I think elsewhere, a feeling of, for prison reform uh, to treat people more humanely. But I would say that this is uh, an element of the whole Sermon on the Mount that we don't pay very much attention to. My comment. Thank you. Uh, I have one. Well, I just noticed the difference in uh, language between these two. And I was really struck by St. Basil calling us thieves. You know, we think of others as thieves, but he called us thieves. And I think um, that really struck me when I listened to Wesley because his language was different, same message, but just, you know, not the same judgment um, through that one word. That really struck me. Thank you, Heather. Somebody else who jumped out at you there. Yeah. Shane? Okay, good. I have one more um, on that topic. I mentioned um, mentioned St. John Chrysostomo. Uh, so we're going back to Damascus, back to the uh, uh, Roman times in the early, early fourth century. And here's what uh, Here's what St. John Chrysostom uh, wrote. Uh, he was one of the fathers of the church, and in fact, one of the um, cluster that developed the Nicene Creed. So um, if you 
for the recyclation fee at St. John Chrysostom going to uh, have a great hand in uh, employment. Okay, this is When You Give by St. John Chrysostom. Indeed, this is also theft, not to share one's possessions. I shall bring testimony from the divine scriptures, saying that not only the theft of others' goods, but also the failure to share your own goods with others is theft and swindle. Accusing the Jews, God's prophet Malachi says, the earth has brought forth her increase, but you have not brought forth your times. God says this to show the rich that they may hold the goods of the poor, even if they have inherited them, or no matter how they have gathered their wealth. Let me read that sentence one more time. God says this show the rich that they hold the goods of the poor, even if they, the rich, have inherited them, or no matter how they have gathered their wealth. When we do not show mercy, we will be punished, just like those who steal. Our wealth is the Lord's, however we may have gathered it. If we provide for those in need, we shall obtain great plenty. This is why God has allowed you to have more. Not for you to waste on prostitutes, fine drink, fancy food, expensive clothes, and other kinds of indolence. So any, uh, any contrast between uh, John Wesley and, uh, and John Chrysostom or anything that struck you out of uh, Chris is still nice. Did you hear me? Yeah, it's judgmental what you just said. Oh, yeah. Fortunately, I had a phone call from my doctor and I didn't hear Wesley. Um, but I think this speaks directly to where we're at as a nation in terms of end stage capitalism and uh, the fact that indeed our incredible wealth is theft. Um, I think I think that's right on target. The the end there about having plenty and licentiousness and all that. I don't I'm not sure about that. <laughs> but um but but you know I I feel strongly that that's an important part of the Christian message for our, us to hear these days. That those like us in our generation, who many of us inheriting money from our parents. Um, uh, you know, that to live in a society structured such that that wealth gets greater and those who are poor get poorer. Um, I think this is speaking right to us. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, others? Uh, Roger? I might just mention a, a book that I'm, I'm reading now called Poverty by America by Desmond, and it's lays out how we, of all the rich nations, we're, we have the biggest percentage of poor people. And it's because we created the systems that need changing. So Desmond is the author, I can't remember his first name. Poverty, Matthew Desmond, I think, yes. Uh, poverty, comma, by America. Would you give us that, uh, I, I missed it, Maybe others did too. Would you give us that statistic? America has the highest percentage of. Yeah, he just made the point that of all the wealthy nations, our percentage of, uh, of uh, poor people is higher than any others. How many people already knew that? How many people are surprised? I okay, well. Thank you, that was very helpful. St. Francis of Assisi. Um, I, I visited Assisi, seen the church, saw where he preached to the birds, and so forth. And I, I've always been a bit amused by St. Francis of Assisi. 
but he, uh, it, it turns out, at least in the passage uh, that I read here, that he was a very, a very powerful thinker and uh, quite uncompromising when it comes to um, the cult. St. Francis of Assisi. Let us consider, my dear brethren, what our vocation is. It is not only for our own salvation that God has called us to, called us by his mercy, but it is for the salvation of many others. In order that we should exhort all the world, more by example than by words, to do penance and to keep the divine precepts. Go then and exhort people to do penance for the remission of their sins and for peace. You will find some who will receive you with pleasure and willingly listen. Others, on the contrary, spend to you and be hostile. Make up your minds to bear all this humble and humble patience. Let nothing alarm you. In a very short time, many learned and noble persons join themselves to you, join themselves to you to preach to kings, princes, and nations. Be therefore patient in tribulation, fervent in prayer, fearless in labor unassuming in speech, brave in your manners. The kingdom of God will be your reward. Sounds like a pretty heavy uh, uh, challenge St. Francis has given to us here. This, um, this passage is in response to um, response of the Beatitudes and what St. Francis is saying. We've been blessed with nothing special to deserve it. Let's go and share that blessedness with um, uh, with less fortunate. Who puts it in terms of penance? Is that penance? Yes. Mm -hmm. Like uh, we're being punished. Well, some a, a priest once said to me, "Doing penance is not punishment. Huh? It's doing something good to make up for something bad." Ah, that I thought was really a better way. Yes, yes. explain it. Ah, uh, get better. Did it. everyone hear what Leah said? Yeah. Okay. Oh, did you repeat? Oh. No, 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 excuse me. Are we in the spirit? Oh, or the music? The music. Oh, okay. Well, I can sit up here. Yeah, why don't you sit up here? Sorry. Well, I went to a priest once, um, and he said, doing penance is not punishment. It is doing something good to make up for either not having done anything you should have, or having done something you consider bad. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm coming to the last uh, segment that I'm going to read and go out, and then we'll have some uh, some time for yes, some time for general discussion. Um, I was very taken when I was looking through the table of contents here to find uh, Theodore Dostoevsky and Leo Tolstoy uh, commenting um, and writing on the, um, on the Sermon on the Mount. So here is Dostoevsky on judging others. And this, of course, is from the um, uh, Book of Matthew as well. <laughs> Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. That's a passage we're relatively uh, familiar with. Um, let's see what um, let's see what Dostoevsky says 
for Solomon. Let not the sin of men disturb you in your actions. Do not say, sin is mighty. Wickedness is mighty. The evil environment is mighty. We are lonely and helpless. And the evil environment is wearing us away and hindering our good works from being done. Pretty um, hopeless uh, 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 introduction. But then he goes on. But do not judge, or you too will be judged. In the same way you judge others, you will be judged. Remember that you cannot, and, and I just was quoting that from Matthew, because we go on here. Here's Dostoevsky again. Remember, you cannot be the judge of anyone. If the evil doing of men moves you to indignation and overwhelming distress, even to a desire for vengeance on the evildoers, above all, shun that feeling. Go at once and seek suffering for yourself, as though you yourself were guilty of that wrong. Accept that suffering and bear it, and your heart will find comfort. You will understand that you too are guilty, that you might have been a light to him and to others. You are not a light. If you had been a light, you might have lightened the path of others as well as the evildoer, and the evildoer might have been saved from his sin by your life. Okay, any, uh, any response to what Dostoevsky uh, has to say? Okay, well, I found it pretty, I found it pretty straightforward and, and uh, rather harsh, but the, um, it certainly puts an exclamation point after um, the uh, commandment that uh, Jesus gives in, uh, recorded in the book of Matthew. Do not judge, you will be judged. In the same way you judge, others will judge you. And Dostoevsky has taken a giant step beyond that. Uh, those are the uh, those are the commentaries starting from the very beginning of the church in the uh, fourth century, um, all the way up to the um, all the way up to the last well, twentieth century, especially the nineteenth century, um, and what. What I found very interesting is uh, in Sunday school and in, and in reading the Bible, pretty familiar with the Sermon on the Mount, if you, if you all are. Um, but this, uh, this commentary by Dostoevsky uh, uh, really bolted me a bit, and uh, as did some of the others. Uh, so any uh, any other um, that's the readings that we have. Any other insights uh, or responses you want to uh, you can share with us? Yeah. <laughs> it would be interesting to have another class um, after this one. It's been since these theologians um, that are very powerful. It was very interesting to hear this morning. But theologians since then, um, uh, in many cases, um, are uh, viewing the scripture from the perspective of those who have been in prison, from the perspective of those who have been judged, from the perspective of the poor. Um, so it's a you know an entirely different way of looking at the scripture. So it'd be interesting to take these gems uh, and to go further and say what uh, what's the scripture telling us from that side of the or you from that side of things. 
Okay. I will swear that this was not a planted comment. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that uh, we know that we have not delved into mm -hmm. the topic as deeply as we can. And uh, there are also in this book, as well as in other places, uh, more contemporary uh, things. So I think that we can all uh, express our appreciation to Stuart for bringing us back to uh, the sermon on 